Good morning. It's a very chatty bunch this morning. Okay. Uh, welcome to the fall. Uh, how about that, huh? Boy, 16 years, it dies hard, doesn't it? Right, Bucks County Commissioner's meeting for June 1st, 2022. Uh, we're going to begin with the Pledge of the Flag, and then we are going to um, recognize a moment of silence, uh, not only for the tragedy in Texas, but also for um, the gun violence that um, is permeating our society, unfortunately, over the past well, year or so, especially. So, please rise. Thank you. All right, we have some nice uh, early presentations today. Uh, we're going to begin with the Teacher of the Year Award, uh, and Commissioner DiGiralo has a proclamation to read. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I have the, uh, the pleasure of recognizing uh, Meg Eubank of Hilltown as a Teacher of the Year. And I'm going to read the citation. Meg, welcome. Thank you. I'm going to read the citation uh, for you. Whereas Meg Eubank of Hilltown has earned a prestigious distinction of being named the 2022 Teachers of English to Speakers of Other Languages Association Teacher of the Year, an award that honors exceptional, exceptional, it's exceptional English. <laughs> <laughs> language, teaching at all levels. I'll have to come and be a student, Meg. <laughs> As a professor at Bucks County Community College, Ms. Eubank is also earning her doctoral degree at the University of Houston. Ms. Eubank was initially drawn to teaching English as a second language to help build community among students from across the globe. Throughout Ms. Eubank's teaching career and volunteerism, she has taught and assisted several thousand students from more than 100 countries, often dealing with virtual classroom settings and different time zones. Whereas Ms. Eubank is always encouraging her diverse group of students to advocate for themselves and to connect with one another. Now, therefore, do we, the Board of the Bucks County Commissioners, hereby recognize and congratulate Meg Eubank upon, upon being named the 2022 TESOL Teacher of the Year. In so doing, we commend Ms. Eubank's talents and leadership in conveying English as a second language to students from all over the world. Meg, congratulations. Let's hear a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you'd like to say a few words, I mean, sure. you'd be. Well, this award. First of all, it's incredibly humbling and incredibly exciting. And uh, the reason why I won the award was because during the pandemic, when we switched to virtual teaching, I was teaching students from, um, from here in America, but also all over the globe. And a lot of students had to go home to their home countries. And I was teaching, um, I think it was how many, different time zones, I put it somewhere on the slide, um, like six different time zones or something. So we couldn't have synchronous classes where we were meeting together. And um, I had to come up with a really creative hybrid teaching situation where we would have uh, discussion boards where we were verbally speaking to each other in recorded bits and having conversations and things like that, and trying to create a really engaging community somehow when we're all scattered across the globe. And somehow it worked and it came together and um, TESOL recognized me for that work during the pandemic and my work previously as well. So I do a lot of work with nonprofits as well. Um, and on my other slide, I have some current initiatives that are going on. 
I have to um, give a nice shout out to Bucks County Community College where I currently work. And we are now enrolling for a summer bridge program, which helps students who are coming out of high school and going into college and it bridges their college experience. So they can earn some college credit this summer. They can uh, get some support. There's built-in tutoring, built-in workshops, all sorts of great things. So please tell everybody you know about the Summer Bridge. We're enrolling now, and it'll start in July. And then um, I also volunteer for a couple local nonprofits. Uh, one is Immigrant Rights Action, here, based right here in the borough of Doylestown, that helps um, immigrants with resources as they arrive to this new country. And um, in a similar vein, the Immigrant Platform, which is an online-based uh, nonprofit that has a website with all sorts of resources and Zoom ESL classes as well for people learning English. All right. Well, thank you very much. Please come forward. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. So twice a year, we recognize the literary art of poetry. We do a Poet of the Year and also a High School Poet of the Year. Uh, so today we have um, with us uh, Bucks County High School Poet of the Year, uh, who I'm going to read a proclamation for. Whereas the County of Bucks and Bucks County Community College annually sponsor a High School Poet of the Year competition. And whereas in 2022, honoree, the 2022 honoree is Lauren Burchell, a junior at Central Bucks High School West. And whereas Lauren was selected from more than 100 Bucks County High School student entries by the judging panel composed of current Bucks County Poet Laureate Nicole Steinberg and 2020 Laureate Jane Edna Moeller. And whereas the work submitted by Lauren includes One Fish, Two Fish, Girl Fish, Boy Fish, Secondary Succession, and an Ode to Celine. And whereas after being a finalist two years in a row, Lauren's selection this year proves that dedication and hard work pays off when you put your mind to it. And whereas Lauren, three student runners up and three finalists were honored at a poetry reading and celebration held May 14th. Now, therefore, do we, the Bucks County Board of Commissioners, uh, hereby recognize Lauren Burchell as the 2022 High School Poet of the Year in the County of Bucks. In doing so, we commend and applaud Lauren's creative gift of poetry and contributions to the literary tradition of our community and wish them the best in their future pursuits. We encourage all Bucks County residents to look to Lauren's poems for insight, enjoyment, and inspiration. And I believe Lauren has a poem for us here before we give the proclamation. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, I would like to read my poem that I, one of the poems I submitted that one for the contest. It's called One Fish, Two Fish, Girl Fish, Boy Fish. It has four parts. One fish. Sometimes I wish I'd cut off my hair by my own hand, stuck the soil colored strands into a used plastic grocery bag, reducing, reusing, recycling. Threw it into a river, let the evidence float away on a current. Maybe the bag will become some unfortunate fish's last supper. But dear God, at least I'd be alive. If all I have to do to survive is second-handedly strangle a fish, then I gladly take on the title of killer. I've already murdered my past self. She's at the bottom of a murky lake now. I haven't been to a lake in years. Two fish. My mother had three children, braided her iron spirit into our hair. When we were just ripening, she'd take us everywhere, anywhere, just to get out of the house. Apples never straying far from the tree. One of our most frequented places was a paradise of a koi pond hidden inside a health center or hospital, or I wasn't particular about that sort of thing a decade ago. But we each chose our favorite fish, tried to find them every time. My mother's pointing finger led our eyes to them. My favorite was an inseparable pair, their markings burning softly through the dappled surface of the water. I rarely needed my mother's murmurs to identify them, for their uniqueness was what I wished to copy, something to make me stand out from my sisters. I didn't know then I would grow up to look nothing like them. But lifespans become cramped within the confines of the indoors, and as a shadow fell over the pond, I could not find my pair of fish. 
I was inconsolable on the inside. The only crack in my facade was a tremble of my lips and a stone in my throat. Within a few seconds, my mother pointed out two beautiful fish, claiming that they were my favorite's child. Did she craft her lie to ease the trouble on my face, or had she never paid enough attention to know the difference? That was the first lie she told me that I did not believe, the first lie that fell apart like a sandcastle built too close to the tide's reaching fingers. Girlfish. There are plenty of girlfish in the sea, but how many girl, sorry, there are plenty of fish in the sea, but how many girlfish are there? How many girlfish are there that like other girlfish that might be boyfish? I cast my line, wait for eternity, reel it in, feel my skin burn and peel under the yellow smudge of the sun. Empty handed, I change my bait, becoming desperate. I cut off my fingers one by one, hoping they like my ring finger best. Impale the digit with the hook, then cast my line again. Perhaps if I tempt them with the right part of my flesh, they will bite. But, on, but girlfish only steal my bait for themselves. I offer these slices of skin just to be robbed, never learning, always hoping the outcome might change. Girlfish slip out of your hands before you can get a grip, swimming upstream as you are swept into the rushing tide. Never yours to treasure, to admire, though they'll take whatever skin you offer up. Boyfish. I observe boys like they are rare fish, and I'm the most dedicated ichthyologist in the last aquarium left standing. I watch the way they arrange their legs when they sit at desks, only crossed about the ankle, or wide open, or with an ankle on an opposing knee, and how they position their hands when they're talking, shoved deep into pockets, or clasped at one wrist, or all over me, and how their clothes tumble down their torsos, flatly across their chest to their stomach. And yet I'm the one encased in hollow glass, strangers staring at me like I'm going extinct. The water is pooling around my knees, enticing me to sink like a stone. I am the freak show, I am the exhibit, and my captor is my body. Thank you very much. Okay, we are also taking time today to recognize Child Welfare Professionals Appreciation Week. And Commissioner Marsegui has a proclamation. Thank you. And whereas the week of June 6th through 10th, 2022, has been proclaimed as Child Welfare Professionals Appreciation Week throughout the Commonwealth, in recognition of the efforts of child welfare professionals serving the children of Pennsylvania. And whereas every day in Bucks County, local children are at risk of child abuse and neglect or have been removed from their home due to such abuse and neglect. And whereas the challenging task of investigating child abuse, assessing child safety, delivering services to families and children and ensuring that the children of Bucks County are nurtured and provided family connections and support and providing service that allow children to remain safely in their home or return home as expeditiously as possible fall into the hands of child welfare professionals. And whereas the work of child welfare professionals may require them to enter situations in which their personal safety is put at risk, including during the COVID-19 pandemic, throughout which caseworkers continue to conduct investigations and work with families in their homes at considerable risk to their own health. And whereas innumerable injuries and deaths of children have been averted due to the efforts of child welfare professionals. So now, therefore, do we, the Board of Commis Bucks County Commissioners, hereby proclaim June 6th through 10th, 2022, as Child Welfare Professionals Appreciation Week throughout the County of Bucks. In doing so, we appreciate, we express our, gra our gratitude and admiration for the important and difficult work performed every day by our excellent professionals at the Bucks County Children and Youth Social Service Agency. And we thank you. Thank you. I see you, Marge. Thank you. We have Marge McCune from the Children Youth Agencies here, Director of the Children Youth. Good morning, Commissioners morning. and everyone. Um, thank you so much for this proclamation. Um, it has been an interesting couple of years for our staff. Uh, to be working in the field with the COVID pandemic uh, and other 
issues that we've had to deal with, as, as my uh, deputy director says, murdered hornets and COVID and everything else <laughs> that we've had to deal with in the field. Um, I thank these people. I'm, I'm just the director. I hang out in the office. These, <laughs> these are the guys that go into the field, and they work very hard every day. And we appreciate very much your recognition of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you bring everybody up? Let's do it. Big picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next presentation is from uh, the Conservation District, uh, and it is focused on a major project that is happening at Lake Luxembourg in Core Creek. Um, and it was something that the uh, Gretchen Schatzschneider, director of the Conservation District, was really interested in making sure that people were aware of the work that's going to be going on. The lake will look very different for a while this summer. <laughs> We don't want people panicking and, and trying to get a good understanding of exactly what work is being done and uh, when it'll start, when it'll hopefully finish, and everything else. So, Gretchen, thank you. I think you just gave my presentation. <laughs> well, I saw it. <laughs> thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, again, I'm Gretchen Schatzleiter, District Manager of the Bucks County Conservation District. And I am really pleased to be able to give you a brief summary of an ongoing effort to uh, restore what we have termed the conservation pool at Lake Luxembourg, and I'll define that for you a little more. Um, and as Commissioner Harvey mentioned, th this project is about to get underway this summer, and it is going to be highly visible uh, from Woodburn Road, and for those people who we know, many people in Bucks County uh, utilize Core Creek and utilize the lake, so there will be you know, some changes, um, but we do hope that once the project is complete, everybody recognizes the benefit and the worthwhileness of conducting it. So could you please sit there? Thank you. Uh, there's a lot on this slide. I apologize. It was uh, animated, but I'm going to walk through it. Just for orientation's sake, uh, I'm sure you all know where Car Creek Park is and Lake Luxembourg, but just for the audience's sake, um, this is an overview and aerial of Lake Luxembourg within Core Creek Park in Middletown Township. And uh, then a photo, an inset photo of the conservation pool from Woodburn Road. Um, and I'm gonna leave those water samples for a moment and just ex describe a little bit for the audience that uh, Lake Luxembourg was created in 1977 and during the time of its creation, it was thought to be a little added benefit that there's a bit of a constriction point at the crossing of Woodburn Road, which creates kind of a forebay, a natural forebay or settling area for the water. Um, there's a 6,000 acre watershed for Core Creek that drains, 99% of it all drains into the Core Creek and comes down into, into Lake Luxembourg through one inlet, just in an inset photo in the back. Um, and that water could be very sediment laden, whether from natural causes or non-point source pollution. But this conservation pool area, this forebay area, created a slowing of the water. And then sediment could drop out in, um, into, the, into the base of the lake. And then the water body of the rest of the lake would be much improved. At the time, it was estimated that it would take 100 years for the conservation pool to reach capacity as far as sediment is concerned. But in reality, due to extreme land use changes of the, de of the decades, 
the conservation pool filled with sediment by 1986. So going from an estimate of 100 years to the reality of nine years. And at that time, we decided, or we, <laughs> the conservation district at that time, decided that they wanted to take on an effort to improve the conservation pool and to work within the watershed to make sure that we could restore this area, improve the water quality within Lake Luxembourg and also the Neshaminy Creek watershed, and uh, stabilize the, um, the watershed in general. Uh, so the, I'll talk, discuss the water samples really quickly. The brown water to the left-hand side, this is a grab sample taken this spring, this April, during a storm event. And you can see the left-hand side water is much darker and has less clarity than the right-hand side of the water sample. The brown water was taken at the inlet to the creek, and then the clearer water was taken at the outlet below the dam, which is really, I'm using that as a visual aid to show you how sediment moves through the system and drops out of the system. Our goal would be to create a system that has much clearer water entering it to begin with, but also then by the time that water would transport below the Woodburn Road, you know, um, causeway or out of that four bay area that it would already look much cleaner and have more clarity so that the, in general, the entire lake body water quality could start improving over the years. Um, so we decided the conservation district with the county's participation and the parks department um, decided to begin this effort to restore the conservation pool. But you can't just go and dredge a project or dredge an area like this without working on the area that is draining it, because otherwise in another nine years, we would have just ended up in the same place and it would have been seen as a Band-Aid project. So, um, so first we needed to look at the entire upper watershed and study that and see what we could, what we could do there so that we could justify a longer lasting uh, result from a dredge project in the conservation pool. So we all know how this pattern goes. Um, right in the early 90s, the, the Parks Department and the county became open to the conservation district starting to work on county properties and uh, the municipalities involved were all very welcoming and did their part locating projects. We, studied the watershed, we created management plans, we designed and implemented projects, and some of those ideas are listed there for you, and all in the hopes of eventually getting to the point where we've stabilized the watershed enough that we could have this capstone project of restoring the conservation pool, which was always our ultimate goal over the last 20 years. Uh, simultaneously of the Conservation District and the Parks Department and the municipalities all doing their work, the EPA and the DEP were conducting these studies and setting metrics that they call a total maximum daily load. I won't go into the ins and outs of that, but basically it's a metric that kind of creates a diet for waterways within the Commonwealth. Um, they identify the overwhelming impairment and they set goals for reductions in those pollutants, if you will. Um, and you can see from our chart that our past projects, once calculated with their nutrient and uh, sediment reductions, did have an impact on what the state set as a required TMDL reduction. So we did have an impact um, from 2000 to 2016, but because of the legacy sediments that were being stored, within the conservation pool and then kind of just transmitted into the lake with every storm event, uh, the likelihood of reaching our goal became, you know, it, it became almost unreachable. Um, but the reductions that we've projected with the estimates and the computer modeling that we've done before applying for this, the dredge funding, we see that it's estimated that we will not only be able to reach the phosphorus reduction, but a triple uh, the redu reduction needed for phosphorus. So we would be 100% achieving the total maximum daily low goal set by the state and by the EPA for uh, Cork Creek for phosphorus. And this single project would account for almost 50% of the needed so total suspended solids reduction 
needed for the project. So um, I wanted to show you these numbers to highlight the importance of this specific individual project and why we consider it our capstone project. It is a dredge project. We're going to achieve these reductions by removing 14,000 cubic yards of sediment that have been legacy deposited in that waterway and sitting within the waterway for the past 25, 30 years. Um, and not only removing it, but creating a natural habitat, a natural wetlands, a channel with a wetland habitat along the side that then will be vegetated and that will uh, then allow for nutrient cycling. And so um, all of the phosphorus that comes down will actually hopefully be utilized within that wetland system before hitting the lake. We also are gonna make sure that we are facilitating some easy access for future maintenance um, because we do estimate that every 15 to 20 years, at least a smaller area, will need to go be um, entered into and maintained by the county, but it shouldn't be let's dredge the entire conservation pool again and again. It should just be let's get some smaller equipment in and remove this potential you know, natural erosion that's going to continue to happen. Um, and yeah, installing a lot of natural habitat features. I don't know, I'm sure most of you are aware that there's some red-bellied turtle, there's some bald eagles, there's a lots of wonderful wetland habitat there and it's a really beautiful, it, it will be a really beautiful area um, once we conduct the project. So that's me, I'm the history of the project. I've been at the district for long enough to have participated in most of these uh, events and these projects. So. I'm going to hand off this presentation to our new watershed specialist, Karen Ogden, who is going to be the future of this project. And she's going to finish up with how we're going to get to the end. Good morning. Um, you know, so how much does it cost? Where's the money coming from? And how are we going to get it done? That's what I want to recap here. Uh, you'll see the, the county, of course, has pledged about $800,000 to this project. The rest of the funding, totaling 2.1 million, came from grants. And you'll see the, the grants lined up on top. So we have uh, the Department of Community and Economic Development with 300,000. EPA, Section 319 grant for 791,000. And National Fish and Wildlife Foundation came in with 250,000. So there are funding sources. You'll notice an asterisk next to dredging under the County of Bucks. I have that noted because that's going to start in August. So the invoices will be rolling in. So fair warning um, to, that you'll be seeing that soon. Um, to this point, the we've in the preparation and with the contracting efforts with uh, Princeton Hydro, um, we've spent about 45,000 under the Section 319 grant, and the county has has. We've spent about 2,200. So again, fair warning, that's going to change quickly <laughs> from August through September. So we can switch my slide. So the project timeline, we expect to open the floodgates mid-July and start lowering the lake over a period of about two weeks until we get to the water level we need to bring the equipment in in early August. Um, they'll start building their construction access and platforms so that the equipment can get in there and actually start excavating the sediments. Uh, the, the spoil will be removed from the pool and dewatered on site for some time before it gets moved to the adjacent farm field where it'll dewater and we will begin incorporating and grading that sediment into the agricultural field um, through August, August through October, really. I mean, it's hard, we can't say day one through day 30 exactly what's gonna be happening, but that time frame is when the equipment will be working. And it'll, it'll look messy. That's when people are going to be driving down Woodburn Road and they'll see an excavator scooping out the lake and wonder what's going on. So, so September through October, hopefully it'll be winding down well. Uh, they'll demobilize, close the gates, let the water level start rising. It must be back to the original level by December 31st to accommodate the bald eagles that start nesting. You'll see that noted. So it, it's a period before we go into winter the sediments will have at least an initial cover crop on them to, to stabilize the soils because we don't want all that sediment flowing right back down in the creek. So we'll stabilize it, let it sit over winter, and then start up again in April, reworking the sediments into the soil and planting, planting the wetlands, doing tree plantings, habitat enhancement. But next spring, 
the heavy lifting will be complete. And then, so into the summer, so the eagles are done, we're working again. July through December, it's really, you know, kind of a cleanup where we're putting in habitat features, we're basking sea turtles or, you know, uh, boosting platforms, different features for the habitat value, which also increases recreational use because it's a viewing site for people on kayaks and boats. So there will be a place to, uh, to paddle around and see what's going on. And you'll see the end will be marked by the farmer planting his spring 2024 crop in that field. And, and that will be that. <laughs> I thought we could go to the next slide, please. I wanted to at least make you aware of the public outreach we're doing. This is really one of them, one of our first public outreach for this summer. We've prepared a frequently asked questions document that is posted on our website. Um, and I'm going to be working with the local print media to see if we can get small articles posted just so people know what's going on. We ask that questions be directed to us the best you can. You have the base knowledge now to at least speak to the project, but if someone comes in with detailed, difficult questions, send them our way and we'll answer them the best we can. We are holding, um, in coordination with Parks and Recreation, a public meeting at Core Creek Park, Pavilion 11, next Monday, right, Monday the 6th, um, you know, the, the primary users of the lake are probably aware that something's brewing, so we would expect them to come and gather more information at that point. Okay, and one more. Some other things I'd like to note, just because there's a lot of unknowns, you know, it, it's summer when we're working, there, things could come up like tropical storms or other events that could, you know, throw a wrench into the works. Um, while it's going on, then the public are not, they're not gonna be able to access and use the lake like they're used to. With the draw down, there are portions of the lake, as you see on the, kind of can see on the image to the right, the red dotted line is approximately where the draw down shoreline will be. So a fisherman wants to go past, there may be four or five feet of mud between the grassy bank and the water line. So people are gonna to have to accommodate, look for different spots. There are other places where there's not gonna be a visible change. So there will be that disruption. There's a concern this that we may see a harmful algal bloom in the lake. So we'll have lower lake levels. It'll be a big change to the aquatic system in a pretty short period of time. Cyanobacteria can sometimes become a problem if they die, if, you know, have massive die off and they release toxins into the water. We'll be monitoring that throughout the summer more intensively than we have in years past, just to make sure that if something is going on, we can um, advise the public to, to be careful and really wash their hands and don't ingest the water. And I wanted to note that we recently installed some in-stream continuous monitoring systems in Core Creek and at the outflow of the dam, we'll be collecting data every 15 minutes for like the next three to five years to try to demonstrate the effect of this project. So hopefully I'll be able to come back to you someday and, and show you new numbers for TNDLs and, and where we are once this uh, is completed. And I believe that was the last slide. So thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, we're easy to reach at the district. Okay. Appreciate any questions for uh, okay. So yeah, a lot of work has gone into this, obviously, as you could tell, uh, not just obviously the slideshow and the presentation, but all the preparatory work and the contracts and everything else. So, um, but it definitely will look different down there. Uh, so, <laughs> so for when people start calling the commissioners or uh, you know other elected officials, then I mentioned kind of reaching out to Middletown Township and having a conversation with them, just so people don't go to their meetings and wonder what's happening to the lake. So, you know, so, sure. Seven eighty-four. Yeah. County pledge. Four hundred thousand of that is for contingencies. So again, if that tropical storm comes, or something throws the, the project off. And, well, we would default on, our, on the other grant funding that has been given, and we did want to specify that the county's funding is going directly for implementation and construction activities, not for consultant fees or oh, anything right. along those lines. Okay, um, well the, yes, our main goal is to reach our 
the TMDL reduction so that our waterways have better water, there's better, more improved water quality and they're self-sustaining systems and they're reaching their water quality so that this, so not necessarily, but re fishable, swimmable, maintain, reaching the uh, designation that the state has set for what they believe that water body should be able to do. And all of our streams should be able to be fishable and swimmable. Um, Lake Luxembourg has been monitored consistently for the last 20 years. There's water clarity, visibility, algae, and harmful algal blooms that occur within the lake. Um, I don't know about the county parks department, but our, the conservation district gets continuous phone calls asking, when are we gonna do something to improve Lake Luxembourg? So it, this has been an ongoing um, effort throughout the county. Right. <laughs> well, describe the survey or why it's necessary. So uh, the red belly turtle is an endangered species, and was it also for bog turtle habitat? Red belly, Pennsylvania threatened species. So in order to do any construction project, you have to clear your site and make or you know get clearances of your site for many endangered flora or fauna, and we know that. I, we've seen them, they're hatching. Yeah. So we know that the red-bellied turtle is on site, so we need to find out where they're located, where they're nesting, and then protect them from the construction activities. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, no, oh. you're fine. Just the, the permitting process requires, you know, due diligence for a yeah. variety of issues, and threatened endangered species is just one of them. And we're also doing, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, the fox is looking at the hen house, but we'll be regulating ourselves, watching ourselves for soil erosion, sedimentation mm -hmm. problems, too. All the permits have been applied and approved based on that early yeah. work. Yeah, it's a, ma it's a massive lake. It's a massive project. So I appreciate all the work you're putting into it and I'm looking forward to seeing it done. All right. Thank you so Thanks. much. Ms. McEvitt, go ahead. 2.1. Yeah, go ahead. Ms. McEvitt had a comment. No, I just, I just wanted to point out that this project's been in the works for, I would say, <laughs> yeah, a, a long time. And then Dave, the funding for the county, is it coming from Growing Greener? Growing Greener, Grown Greener right. So I, I also wanna add, as a former Middletown Township supervisor, when we had the floods in the mid 90s, um, after all the engineering studies were done, it, part of it was blamed on the fact that Lake Luxembourg was overflowing and there was something happening with water and mm -hmm. so they kept saying you need to dredge it. So it's yep. been a long time coming and very necessary. Thank you. and and. Respectfully, yeah, we, we wanted, it did take this long to get it, and we are at this point now because we understand the importance of stabilizing that upstream area so that we're not just repeating the right. same mistake that we, you know, letting it fill in with sediments right. and um, hopefully creating a much more stable and long-lasting system. Yeah. All right, thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Okay, um, public comment period. All right, so there's nothing for, uh, no comment for any agenda items, so we'll move on. We'll come back to the one person who signed up uh, later on. Um, minutes from May 18th, 2020, any, or 2022, any corrections or suggestions, questions? No. Okay, all right. So for today's uh, consent agenda, um, items one through 12, just highlighting a few things, uh, the county, um, Contributing $22,000 uh, for a woman's place, um, $150,000 for truancy prevention, uh, $108,000 for uh, workforce training, uh, welding, and um, um, interns mobile lab, um, $70,000 trail study uh, in Lower Bucks County, $28,000 um, through housing community development for um, some are residents with disabilities, and about $20,000 coming in to the courts for our mental health court. And just some of the highlights. Well, if there are no comments or questions, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda, including the minutes? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The regular agenda, just one item. And I'll, uh, Law Library, and I don't know if uh, Mr. There, Mr. Heckman wants to just talk a little bit about it. Just, just wanted to have this on um, 
it's kind of a big expenditure, and I thought it was interesting. It was a lot of a lot of work went into this. So I appreciate um, uh, the court staff doing their best to to deal with a very difficult situation. I was talking with the President Judge Lord earlier. It's just give an idea of of what the purchase is and some of the some of the unique problems with this that you guys had to struggle with. Yes, this 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 contract contains all of the uh, proprietary print materials that is published by West Publishing under. Thomson Reuters for both the law library, the Court of Common Pleas, the judges, court administration, and the 18 magisterial uh, judges out there. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, this contract is labeled a LMA, as in a library maintenance agreement, which uh, provides cost certainty and, and uh, some smoothing out of uh, the updates that are published to these publications, uh, you know, based on you know, law changes, statute changes mm -hmm. that you know th that can come in at any time, mm -hmm. and that. So this is a uh, this particular contract is a five-year contract. This year, this time, we've got it reduced to um, a only a one percent uh, increase per year which is uh, different than the previous shorter periods of time, which uh, cost, uh, which was a four or five percent per year uh, increase. Um, it is a significant cost. It does represent the lion's share of the printed material uh, for all those entities that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that <clears throat> there is in this, this, this contract is actually less than what we're paying now and will be less for each of those five years, and that. We did discuss with Thomson Reuters if we eliminated a significant amount of the print material, and their response is <coughs> the there's a discount on the amount of, uh, depending on the amount of printed materials that we subscribe to. And what we currently get is an 85% discount on what they estimate as a as two million dollars worth of print material a year, and if we reduced it to the extent that we offered to, uh, that w the discount went down to 24%, and we ended up would be paying 120,000 dollars more a year for less materials than what we are yeah. currently. Subscribe to. Yeah, and when you're talking about you know not as many print materials specifically about going more electronic about more having more things online. Right, right. Yes. Uh, I mean our online contract is a separate contract. Mm -hmm. Right now it is with Lexus Nexus. Uh, we went to them four years, three years ago, because they were significantly le less than Westlaw. They were only a third of the cost, and it saved the county over the four-year contract. Uh, about two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, so we went with them. That contract is up next year, coinc uh, and it coincides with about twelve-month period that we have in this written contract, in this pub the printed material contract, which allows us uh, to reevaluate and make a larger shift to electronic uh, materials rather than printed. That takes place 12 months after this contract is in place, and that is the basically the, the expiration date of the uh, current online contract that, that okay. we have. All right. Yeah, so, so I know we look forward to that opportunity. Yeah. In 12 months. It's a unique situation where you you want to buy a little less, and they charge you a lot more. Correct. Uh, and it's, Absolutely. Yeah. I was mentioning uh, uh, Judge Bateman is one, one, uh, part of my job as a department chair was to buy textbooks. Uh, and there are only about three textbook companies left in the United States. They, oh, they've all merged. Um, and so there's really limits your options That's and right. increases we, the price. <laughs> so, I think this uh, process is really trying, they're still trying to hang on to the printed yeah. uh, word that they, they have. Mm -hmm. And this is the mechanism that they use to do that. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can move more electronic uh, you know, starting next year. But I appreciate all the work you put into it. Any uh, other questions, Mr. Stair? What would happen if we said no? And yeah, we would we would lose uh, the ability to get those updates for those uh, printed materials that that are not available um, 
online. So well, I'm just, I guess I'm looking more for the impact on the court system, on, for attorneys, for the judges. Well, we would not have access to the, the latest, uh, you know, statutory information that we need to make the decisions on. And the attorneys that use the law library uh, would not have, would lose that aspect, you know, that access as well. Do you know how many attorneys are using the law library? Um, not particularly with the attorney. We get about three to 400 people a month. In the one over in, in the courthouse? In, into, in, in, both, in both facilities. Do you know if they're and using? Usually it is more attorneys that come over to the law library because the books are, the main, the main section of books are here. So that's a greater proportion of the attorneys uh, coming over here. Because what, what I've understood from them is that most of them are using the electronic version over in the courthouse law library, that there's very few that are coming over here. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with this, and I feel like there's got to be a better alternative, and uh, it just seems like an awful lot of money for us to spend that for very little use. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. All right. Any other co comments, questions? No? Okay. All right, was there a motion then to approve 13 uh, Thomas Reuters West Carroll uh, Stream, Illinois, 1.3 and change? So moved. Okay, motion made. Uh, second. And seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, personnel actions. Um, any comments or questions on personnel actions? If not, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve the personnel actions. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. One board appointment to the Agricultural Land Preservation Board. Mr. Bartley Millett is filling in for a member who has left the board. His term will go to February 22nd, 2023. Is there a motion to appoint Bartley Millett? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, other civics, uh, Shamrock Reigns, $1,500. Um, is there a motion to approve that expenditure? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Chief Operating Officer, Ms. McEvitt. Thank you, Commissioner. I have a couple of reminders and then a few updates from staff that I'd like to defer some time to, if I might. Uh, first is there, the application deadline for the third round of Buck's built uh, startup fund investment through John Mercer at the uh, Startup Bucks group here in Doylestown. Uh, they fund early stage startup companies and the deadline for the application for the Bucks Built Startup Fund is, for their third round is June, four, June 13th. The investments are about 25,000 a piece um, and it's a cooperation between the county and its industrial development authority and the folks at Startup Bucks. So if you know any companies that are in the early stages, please point them in the direction of John Mercer and the organization of Startup Bucks. Uh, secondly, our Household Hazardous Waste Program uh, has an event on June 25th at the Central Bucks South High School, that's uh, in Warrington Township. And uh, if you go online, you can sign up for, for to drop off your, your household items there. And then if I might uh, parlay some time to, to Tom Freitag, our Director of Board of Elections, to talk about recount activities for their most recent election. Good morning, everybody. So um, most of you probably know, uh, last week the acting Secretary of State uh, ordered a mandatory recount for the uh, Republican side for US Senate. Uh, two candidates came within half a percentage point uh, for the overall vote totals for the state, uh, which triggers a mandatory recount unless uh, the other candidate uh, decides they do, don't want to go through with it. Uh, that did not happen, so uh, we're statutorily mandated by today to begin a recount for just that office. Uh, we've been started this morning at 9 a.m. Uh, we have to be finished uh, by law by next Tuesday at noon. We expect, uh, just based on the recount that we had to do similarly last year in November of 2021, uh, to be done most likely by Friday. Uh, there's about 153,000 uh, ballots that we have to go through, ballots from the polling places, ballots uh, that came by mail-in, provisional, anything that was counted pri prior, we have to recount again. 
Uh, we're using, uh, as the statute says, we have to go use different machines than they were previously scanned on. Uh, so all of the ballots from the polling places are being scanned on our central scanners. Uh, we have two separate models of central scanners. So if they were uh, mail-ins or absentees, were scanned on one model on election day. Uh, they're being scanned on the opposite model now. We've rented three additional scanners from our vendor clear ballot uh, to be able to get done faster uh, before the uh, deadline. And um, we will be reimbursed by the state for a portion of the recount. Uh, the code uh, gives uh, the number of boxes, uh, boxes being either the ballot boxes or the envelopes that we uh, scanned absentee or mail-in batches into, uh, gives a flat fee of $50 per box. So it should be roughly $50,000 uh, that we're reimbursed for. Uh, that does not count, um, they do not reimburse for any overtime or extra staff or extra equipment. Uh, so the county will have to pay for the rentals, but that is lesser than the amount that um, that we've gotten reimbursed for. Does anybody have any questions? No questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Yep. No Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Thank Tom. You. Thanks, Tom. Um, secondly, uh, if I could ask Audrey Kenny, our director of emergency services, to talk about uh, give us an update on emergency preparedness in our communities in Bucks County. Thanks, Margie. Appreciate it. Uh, we all watched last week as the school shooting incident came to light in Uvalde, Texas, uh, just over a week ago. Innocent children were victims of one of the deadliest school shootings um, in our history. In 2022, there have been 27 school shootings so far. Um, we hope that ends today, but we're, we're still working through that, and over 200 mass shootings across the country. During incidents like this, it's important for us to step back, look at our own resources and our plans, and make sure that we're familiar with what's available and we know how to get those resources out there quickly as needed. It's important to note that even though we must continue to, to work our plans and provide additional support and resources to our services, um, we do have a strong foundation here in the county that we've been building on. Our first responders train uh, for this kind of incident. It's a collaborative approach between our police, fire, and EMS services. Um, and they address things like scene security, trauma-based care, um, triage and provide reunification support as well. That's a, an important partnership that we have the Bucks County Intermediate Unit for. They provide incredible resources on our behalf as well. A few other resources that we have in the county as well I'd like to talk about. Uh, we have a, all schools are required to have emergency plans and school safety plans. Um, the schools and police departments participate in specific training which focuses on active shooters. There are, there is a crisis and emergency communication support team that comes out and they help with um, messaging to the school community and the media in times of crisis. We have prepared crisis and flight response team. That's a team that's made up of counselors, psychologists, social workers, and people who are specifically trained in critical incidents to provide care at times of crisis. Recently, they've been deployed to Quakertown School District after um, a tragedy occurred there on Christmas morning. And finally, we have our Safe to Safe Something program. It's an anonymous tip line that's monitored 24-7. It's a place for students and parents to report threats or things that may affect school safety and having a safe school environment. Uh, we would encourage any student or parent to download this app to their smartphone to be able to report incidents that they hear about or rumors that they are um, hearing as well. So that's my update. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Audrey. I appreciate that. Um, and then... Lastly, um, if I could ask Angie, Angie Nagel to, to um, address some shortages we have in our Park and Recreation Department. Sure. Thanks, Thank Margie. You. Thank you. Um, so good news first. Um, all of our recreation facilities are open as of um, June 4th. Um, so they're open in, uh, we're doing a phased opening. So they'll be open on the weekend. And then as, as students um, and, and uh, become available during the summer, all of our facilities will be open daily um, as of June 20th. Those facilities include our two boat rentals, uh, our two pools, Tohican and Oxford Valley, our two tennis centers, and the Oxford Valley golf course. Um, I wanna mention that we have many opportunities to support um, our facilities um, available to not only students, but um, adults looking for part-time work, um, 
retirees. Um, we, will, we will take anyone that um, wants to support our park system. Um, there's two incentives that are new this year. We have an all access parks pass. So join our team and then you have an all access pass to any of the rec facilities um, for the entire summer. Um, we're also offering um, to certify lifeguards um, at our cost. Um, so these are two new incentive programs um, that we hope will draw people to um, become a Parks employee. Uh, finally, I want to mention um, several ways to stay connected to our park system. There's our, um, the, the county website, but there's also three very active social media um, accounts on Instagram, Twitter, um, and Facebook, um, as well as our Pathways Program Guide is now available electronically. So if you missed this round, you can go on the county website, sign up to receive the next round electronically delivered to your inbox. Um, we hope that you are staying connected with our park system and, and enjoying um, all of the resources that we have to offer you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Angie. I appreciate that. OK, and then lastly, um, Thank you, commissioners, for approving uh, uh, our next purchasing director. But I would be remiss in not saying once again, thank you to Maureen for sticking around while we uh, went through the vetting process. Um, and I, I will say, I will admittedly say that I probably drug my feet a little bit. <laughs> um, you have been a mainstay here for a number of years and your service, dedicated service to county government, not only to its residents, but to its staff uh, has been remarkable. So we appreciate that. I especially appreciate your willingness to help us transition to the new director, um, whom you might know. <laughs> um, I, and I want to uh, recognize that uh, the next director will be Liz Gates who is right now serving as the deputy, de I'm sorry, deputy, I must call her deputy, to assistant to the chief operating officer. Um, it's, been, it's been a wonderful two years in such a very difficult time, um, and you have been amazing. Uh, you're, it's gonna be, uh, you've, raised the, you've, you've raised the bar for the next person to come in, so I, I just want you to know that your time with me has been awesome. So I wish you luck. Uh, thank you, Maureen. And um, on, to, on, to better, on to better days. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Solicitor's report. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, thank you, Maureen, and congrats to Liz. Um, I'll begin by noting that the board had its uh, standing executive session yesterday. Uh, they conducted that with the staff and legal counsel to discuss collective bargaining negotiations. Uh, to um, discuss updates and potential settlement of pending litigation, uh, as well as personnel and employment matters. Uh, second, I was asked by our, uh, our deputy COO and, and chief clerk, Gail Humphrey, uh, just to piggyback on Mr. Freitag's comments about the election. Um, a lot of folks may have heard in the news that there's a lot of litigation concerning the election. Um, and uh, here in Bucks um, this year, that's actually all being overseen from a litigation standpoint by our first assistant, uh, County Solicitor Amy Fitzpatrick, um, uh, who was in Harrisburg yesterday uh, for argument uh, on one of those matters. So just at a high level, what's going on right now is um, one of the, the, those campaigns in the Senate primary in the McCormick campaign um, filed lawsuits against dozens of counties in Pennsylvania. Um, the essence of those challenges were um, Pennsylvania's requirement that um, voters who send in mail-in or absentee uh, or overseas ballots um, uh, provide a signature. Um, and so there was a request to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court um, to exercise their original jurisdiction. Um, they declined to do that. Um, that's called a King's Bench petition. But the Commonwealth Court is where a lot of those cases then would otherwise start. And so that's where um, Ms. Fat, Ms. Fitzpatrick and other attorneys for counties across Pennsylvania um, were making argument. So that litigation is playing out separately uh, folks may have heard about, um, uh, not in state court, but in federal court, um, litigation that started uh, you know, in our neighboring county, in Lehigh County, uh, uh, a dispute about the 2021 election. Um, and there the issue concerned the dating requirement uh, on those same kinds of ballots, overseas, military, and absentee. Um, and the appeals court um, for the region that covers Pennsylvania and New Jersey, it's the Third Circuit, 
um, had issued a ruling saying that the dating requirement um, was invalid. Um, and just last night, um, uh, this, the U.S. Supreme Court assigns a justice to cover each of these circuits. Um, the only member on the Supreme Court that started in the Third Circuit is Justice Alito, and so he's overseeing the Third Circuit. Um, he has the power to issue a temporary stay, meaning that that opinion isn't really controlling right now until the U.S. Supreme Court decides whether to take that case. So lots going on. Uh, in the meantime, um, everyone heard from Mr. Freitag that the board is, is um, doing its job uh, to the letter of the law. Uh, finally, I'll um, share that uh, our Consumer Protection Department um, uh, continues to receive consumer complaints about used car sales. Um, it's always one of their top issues that they receive uh, complaints about. Um, recently, there has been an uptick in complaints uh, from non-native English speakers uh, who have been alleging deceptive business practices uh, from a very small group of uh, businesses. Um, so the department wants everyone to know um, that they have any concerns or English, excuse me, any concerns or issues, um, they can contact Consumer Protection 1-800-942-2669. Um, uh, email is consumerprotection at buckscounty.org. Uh, on Twitter, they're at Bucks, at Bucks Consumer, and they'll do, do their very best to make sure that everyone has access to the full services of their department. And that concludes, my, concludes our report. Thank you. Okay, we move to uh, public comment. Uh, Chris Keeley, right? Kiley, I'm sorry. You have to come up to the microphone here, sorry. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to speak about the mail and drop boxes, and um, I would like or request a lot of people in the county I know uh, are not happy with mail and drop boxes. Um, they're a recipe for fraud. Uh, and Bucks County actually was canvassed. I'm not uh, sure if you're aware of the canvassing results. No, I'm not. No, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Okay, I'm just going to go over a few. Um, this is from the 2020 election, and it still hasn't been addressed. So there were 181 addresses attempted. 68.89% uh, of those addresses had uh, registration count discrepancies. 54.4% had phantom reg registrations. Uh, <laughs> 13.4% were missing registrations. 54% had vote count discrepancies. 29.2% had phantom votes. 24.72% showed missing votes. So that's just a small. Could you tell us where your data comes from? Pardon me? Could you tell us where your data came from? Audit the vote, PA. So that's just a small sample in one county. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be addressed. So um, I'm just here to, you know, make you aware. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're aware of the movie 2000 Mules that just came out recently. Uh, it basically spoke about the mail and drop boxes and the fraud that goes on. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> that was the, <clears throat> the only person who signed up for public comment. Just um, as a as a reminder, there were <clears throat> two instances of fraud which were discovered in Bucks County. Um, that was discovered by our Board of Elections staff, turned over to the district attorney who, pro who filed charges against those two individuals who had tried to vote uh, using mail-in ballots in the names of their deceased mothers. <clears throat> they were caught at the very beginning part of the process, which is exactly how the system is supposed to work. Um, in fact, this county was sued 11 times in, after the 2020 election, um, and every single uh, lawsuit was dismissed. Thanks to the legal staff and the Board of Elections staff we have doing their jobs. Um, in fact, in one of those cases, the attorney for the Trump campaign had to admit in public, uh, in a court, uh, that he had no evidence of fraud in Bucks County. 
So um, drop boxes are new to Pennsylvania. They are not new to the country. They are used everywhere um, all, in most states, um, including very, very red states like Utah uh, and, uh, and blue states as well. Uh, they've been used for a very long time. Um, and so uh, I applaud the efforts of our staff here to make sure they did their jobs properly. Um, there was an audit of Bucks County elections, an actual audit uh, done by the state, which found that there was not uh, any kind of fraud that we could find. So, uh. I would just add that you have to be very careful at information that you might read or hear about or look at because it is not, most of the time it might not be accurate. And as the commissioner said, we, we did a thorough investigation of everything and I don't know where that's coming from. So yeah. thank you. Okay. okay. All right. Commissioner's comments, um, Commissioner Drella. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to have a few comments about uh, what we celebrated on Monday and over the weekend, uh, Memorial Day. Uh, I remember as a, a young boy growing up, and we didn't actually call it Memorial Day. We called it Decoration Day, and I think at, at some point, the federal government actually changed, changed the name. And the Decoration Day, uh, I believe, goes back to the very beginning after the Civil War when we first started celebrating the holiday when the people from the towns, mainly the women and the children, would go out and decorate the graves of the Civil War fallen soldiers. And that's how it got the name uh, Decoration Day. And I'll tell you, Watching our county celebrate, uh, I don't know if celebrates a, the right word to use, but the memorial, uh, remembering the men and women all over the county who died protecting our country through the years, protecting our freedom, protecting our democracy, protecting our way of life, that all of us enjoy in this country. And I'll tell you, it was really inspiring. I mean, so many communities uh, had parades or services, and I know a lot of the churches did as well. Uh, I attended one at my church at St. Ephraim's, uh, where it was not just about the fallen, the men and women who had died, but also about recognizing our veterans. And, uh, we had a service and it was, again, very, very inspiring. Um, so I, I, I just wanna thank everybody all over Bucks County. I know we had a parade in Ben Salem, which I participated in. And I don't know how many people were there at the parade route. I know it was in the thousands, not the hundreds. And uh, you know, we went through two years of COVID and I think the ceremonies were kind of like, uh, you know, not as great as they have been. But this year, it was, again, very, very inspiring for me to watch all over the county. We had a, uh, we had a memorial celebration here at the courthouse on Friday. So it was just not Monday. It was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday that these ceremonies went on around the county. And, and again, it was just so very, very inspiring. I want to thank everybody who participated and thank all the municipalities and boroughs and the county for all the work that they do to make it happen. And finally, uh, I just want to echo the words uh, from Margie about Maureen, thank you for your good work. I know you're going to be uh, around for a little bit uh, training uh, our new director. God bless you. <laughs> but, <coughs> but thank you, really, for your good work. And uh, to the new director that, that's here in the back, uh, Liz Gates, as, and as Margie said, she was the, uh, she was the, I guess, secretary to the COO. But boy, she was a lot more than that. She really was. I mean, uh, it gets pretty chaotic sometimes up on that fifth floor. And uh, she just did, I think Margie used the word, amazing job in uh, making sure everything ran smoothly, whether it was a Zoom meeting or the 100 other things that we, we have to do up there. Uh, she was terrific. And uh, me and Liz, I don't know if you all know, we had a little competition about who would get there in the morning first. 
And I can tell you, I won a lot more times than she did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Liz, thank you. Uh, I, I, we're, we're just going to miss you so much up there on the fifth floor. But, you know, I used the word bittersweet. Uh, we're sorry to see you go. But uh, we're, we're all very, very happy. And all the best at success in your new position that you're moving into. But we really are, we're really going to miss you. Thank you. Commissioner Segley. Just a quick shout out of thanks to our Director of Corrections and the Department of Corrections. They recently had an inspection and I know that it was a ton of work to get ready for and you did very well and I know it's difficult times in corrections right now. So thank you and thank your staff. Um, yeah, not, a, not a whole lot to add. <clears throat> uh, just echo Commissioner DiGiralamo's comments, thanking all of the organizations, VFWs, American Legion posts, uh, municipalities, police departments, fire departments, uh, who had a hand, and all the volunteers who had a hand in all of the celebrations, the parades, the memorial services that happened over this past weekend. Um, and um, <clears throat> I was mentioning at a couple of the places I was at that um, it was an interesting Memorial Day because uh, last Monday, the Monday before Memorial Day, um, this county had a chance to properly recognize and bury one of his own, um, an Army private named Walter Wildman, uh, from born and raised in Bristol Borough, who was killed in action in November 1944 uh, in the Hurtgen Forest in Germany. Um, his body was not positively identified. It was buried in the Netherlands in an American cemetery. Um, but for decades, there was suspicion as to who this person was. Uh, and just really in the last few years, the Department of the Army continuing its ongoing efforts to identify uh, remains of American service members around the world, um, used DNA technology and positively identified Private Wildman and brought his body back to Bucks County uh, for the first time in almost 80 years. Um, and he was buried at Washington Crossing Cemetery. And so it was nice to see was a, there was you know, some local veterans out. There were, um, um, it was covered by the media, which I thought was, was great. Um, uh, you know, I had the honor of being there just representing the county. Uh, Bristol Borough had a few representatives there representing the borough. Um, one of the saddest parts, I think, was that Mr. Wildman's family from Bucks County has passed on or moved away. Uh, and so, you know, here was, uh, here was a, a serviceman who, you know, uh, answered the call of his country, um, went to Europe uh, to fight fascism and protect democracy, uh, lost his life, uh, and then lay anonymous for almost 80 years. Um, and when he came home, you know, his, uh, how many of his family members who never knew exactly what happened to him. Um, there was one distant cousin who had heard about it, uh, he lived in Atlantic City, and he just happened to drive up uh, just because he wanted to be there. <clears throat> and um, he ended up getting, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of attention from the media and from the uh, Department of the Army and others who were there, which he completely did not anticipate. Um, but, uh, but it was, I think, kind of the, the point of Memorial Day in many ways is not, you know, it's, it's remembering those who, who have passed on, but especially thinking about those whose stories didn't get an ending, um, and who, how many of their families and how many of their friends um, have passed on and never knew the ending. And Private Wildman finally got his ending, uh, and it was here in Bucks County. So uh, it was uh, it was that in my mind throughout the, this week and, and over the weekend. So I'll thank uh, our staff for all the work they do. Uh, I'll echo the comments thanking uh, Marie McElveen for all the work she's put in over the decades. Uh, and I will congratulate Ms. Gates. Uh, she's going back to purchasing. Uh, you know, she was there for a little while and learned the ropes, and now she's got to, you know, we kind of, you know, undid a lot of that. Now she's got to go back and, you know, <laughs> learn how to, how to be more disciplined, I think, now. But she was, you know. But we certainly will miss her uh, on our start part of the fifth floor. Um, you're going to have to buzz yourself in. You're not, we're not going to give you a card. And, you know, so, <laughs> so uh, but I want to attend a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.